Thanks, Carol. Thanks for reviewing our hygiene guidelines. They're really, really important. We want everyone here to be healthy. And we're really proud of our level of adherence to the guidelines and attention to these important meeting protocols. Thank you all for your patience in this. We're now going to begin our main program this morning. We ask you to take a moment to turn off your cell phones, turn them to vibrate or airplane mode or turn them off or whatever. And I'd like to bring up to the podium our executive director, Carol Jenkins. This is Carol's 11th CFRI conference. Please help me give her a warm welcome. Good morning. Thank you. So I am Carol Jenkins, the Executive Director of Cystic Fibrosis Research Incorporated, and I would like to welcome you to CFRI's 26th National Family Education Conference, getting in tune with CF Today, our latest research and best practices. It is wonderful to look around the room and see so many friends and colleagues that make up our community. Our board and volunteers, Kristen is here today from our board. Where are you, Kristen? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Our speakers, our researchers and panelists, our donors and our sponsors, you are the orchestra that surrounds the quartet of the CFRI office staff with such energy that makes this event possible. So for you, we present a symphony of CF education and support. Now, Plato said that music gives soul to the universe and wings to the mind. In that spirit, we invite you to tune in to this weekend's conference and fill yourself with hope and renewed energy after learning about advances in medical care that are happening now to improve the quality of life for you and your loved one. The past couple of years have been a very exciting period in the life of CF research, and there's much to celebrate about recent discoveries in the field of cystic fibrosis, and there's still much more to do. CFRI continues to play a major role in empowering new researchers to become invested in understanding this challenging disease. For the past 38 years, the research we have funded has contributed critical new information to CF medical science. We are an important part of the process that leads to new trials and drug development and new strategies for wellness for people with CF. And now, most of you know that CFRI was started 38 years ago by a small group of family members whose purpose was to fund CF research and to raise awareness of this disease. Keeping the core values from those earliest years, we have grown remarkably, and we're now recognized at a national level for our support of the CF community. At this point, I would like to invite CFRI's first executive director, Ann Robinson, to come up and join me. CFRI is heading into another major transition this year. I will be retiring on September 13th after 10 years as executive director and a member of a most remarkable organization. I have felt the warmth, the strength, the spirit of the CF community, and your passionate commitment to working together so that we may help all who have this challenging disease. Thankfully, I have had Anne as a role model. Her continued presence at CFRI has been a gift to me. She's been my teacher, my mentor, and a partner. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, with the help of the CF community, 38 years ago, what we started in a tiny office in San Jose has turned into this large organization. We have grown into a strong organization that is well respected locally, nationally, and throughout the world. And thank you to all of you who have helped do this. Thank you, Carol, for your dedication to CFRI, your energy, and your you've been a talented conductor of CFRI. You're able. You're able to get the many facets 
of CFRI to work together in harmony and to produce the most glorious results. Being the ED of CFRI is a very demanding job, and I know this for a fact. <laughs> but it's also very rewarding. I am happy and glad to have the opportunity to have been the first ED of CFRI and to work with you during your tenure as executive director. I look forward to working with the executive director that follows you. I have known her for over 25 years, and we are so fortunate to have her to carry for us. Thank you. Great. Stay right here. So our incoming ED is Sue Landgraf. Sue, will you please join us? <laughs> Sue was introduced to CFRI 25 years ago when her daughter at age five was riding a horse in the CFRI parade of champions in Monterey. This beautiful girl had been diagnosed with CF at 22 months old. And since that event, Sue has been involved with CFRI as a volunteer, fundraiser, mentor for me, finance committee member, and board member. She brings nearly 25 years of nonprofit employment experience at the highest level. And just as importantly, she has lived the life of a mother of a child who is now 23 years, oh, sorry, she's 29 years old, 29 years old, happily married with cystic fibrosis. Sue understands the world of CF and the challenges faced by those living with this disease. Thank you, Carol. Well, I have to tell you, it is an honor to be the next ED for CFRI, and I think it is a real testament of strength that you're seeing the three of us standing up here together, the past, the present, and the future, and that is certainly a sign of strength for CFRI. I'm honored to be the next ED. It's been an important part of my family for 25 years. My daughter has benefited greatly from the, the knowledge base at CFRI, and I'm glad to give back and I hope to meet as many of you as possible this weekend. Thank you. So just a final remark that Gustav Mahler wrote, the real art of conducting consists of transitions, and CFRI will move forward without skipping a beat. So here we are, three executive directors of CFRI, wow. We've already worked together for years. I expect that to continue even in my retirement. I expect also they'll know where to find me. In closing, I would like to thank our donors for your continued support and our generous sponsors for making this conference possible. Please check in with our sponsors this weekend. You will learn so much from them at each table in the foyer. Um, Thank you to our volunteers, our researchers, our presenters, our moderators, our facilitators and panelists. All of you make this possible. All of you are giving your time. And to the wonderful staff at Sofitel for their masterful care of the weekend. And maybe most important for me, I thank my staff. They are the best. Please enjoy this 26th National Cystic Fibrosis Family Education Conference, getting in tune with CF today latest research and best practices. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. We have just a few brief announcements and then we'll introduce our first speaker. Uh, we want to inform you that the second most important rule at CFRI after our hygiene guidelines is that all questions are welcome. There is a uh, microphone stand right in the middle of the room. At the end of each uh, presentation, uh, should there be time, we'll have a Q&A period. We'll bring this microphone out there. And then on Sunday, the uh, speakers will also appear on the Ask the uh, Experts panel. So um, we all have varying degrees of CF knowledge. If you are a newcomer or young to CF, please know that no question is too simple. Uh, we request that when asking a question or making a comment, you speak clearly into the microphone. 
Finally, make use of the back of your brochure for notes or the pads located on your table. Handouts and PowerPoints will be made available on our website after the conference. Now let's get to what we've been waiting for, today's speakers. Thank you. Our first speaker is Dr. Dr. Patrick Flume. He's here to discuss the CF Therapeutic, or Drug Development Pipeline, with us. Dr. Flume is Director of the Medical University of South Carolina, or MUSC, Cystic Fibrosis Center in Charleston, and also Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics at MUSC. Though he continues to practice general pulmonology and critical care medicine, his primary interests are in CF and bronchiectasis, that's a, that's a mouthful, bronchiectasis, and chronic airway infections. He is an active clinical research program, chairs the advisory committee of the MU, MUSC General clinical, clinical Research Center, and directs the Cardiopulmonary Exercise Laboratory and the MUSC Pulmonary and Rehabilitation Program. Dr. Flume is recognized by the national and international CF community and serves on the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Center Committee, among others. And there's way more, but you need to read his bio in the program. I've been asked to keep this short, so please help me welcome Dr. Flume. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. When I started in CF, which was uh, during my fellowship training about 23 years ago, as Mark Pine had stated last night, we didn't have any medicines short of digestive enzymes for the purpose of treating patients with CF. And we live now in a very different world. We have many medications, and we talk about how best to use them. And it's a very exciting time in our life because the pipeline is very robust. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I have a lot of material to go through, so I'm just going to say put on your seatbelts because we're going to go through a great deal. First, as a matter of disclosure, we'll go this way. Um, my work is principally in uh, clinical trials and drug development. And so I work with a lot of different companies to help them try to bring uh, their products uh, forward. And so what you see here is all of the grant support that, that we've had have all been related to CF-related products. And so much of what I say today is from some of that work uh, that has been done. In order to talk about the pipeline, I just want to make sure we all understand the, the pathophysiology of lung disease. And I'm going to restrict my comments to lung disease principally today. So as everyone knows, this is a genetic disease. Um, these kids are born with genetic mutations and that results in an abnormality of the CF protein. So CFTR, the Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator. That's a mouthful, so we say CFTR. It's actually much more complicated than that, and so we'll try to simplify that into uh, the reality is that there's different types of mutations, some that result in a reduction in the quantity of protein, and some which make plenty of protein, but the protein doesn't work right. And that's terribly important as we start developing strategies of how to treat this. But the bottom line is it results in an abnormality at the airway surface. And this protein is very important for maintaining the airway surface liquid, as can be demonstrated in this video produced by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And so what you see here is we're hovering across the airway surface. And you see these cilia, these little hair-like projections working together in a very important layer of fluid, moving that mucus or other material that's in the airway up and out where you can then cough and clear it. So if we zoom into that uh, cellular surface, now we're at the top of the cell, and what you see here are two different types of proteins. The first one in the orange there is the CFTR, and flowing through that is chloride. In the back are the blue channels. Those are sodium channels that are absorbing the salt. Uh, sodium, and these are very important for maintaining that fluid. And there are other functions, this is an oversimplification, but that's uh, a reasonable representation. So in cystic fibrosis, what's abnormal is either the protein isn't there, or it's not working correctly, and that airway surface liquid becomes shallow, 
the cilia can't work, and therefore nothing gets cleared up out of the airway. So in this particular example, this is a case in which the protein is there, but it's not working. Nothing is flowing through it. So that is the basic process in which we think that the abnormality is occurring at the airway surface. So that reduction in airway surface liquid results in impaired mucociliary clearance, this very important mechanism of clearing things up and out of the airways. That has several ramifications, one of which is obstruction. The airways are now obstructed, and as can be seen in this image, which is a lung biopsy, what you see here is the airway wall coming around, and you see this big plug obstructing the airway. And that's occurring in all of the airways and causing not just air to have a problem flowing out, but actually getting that material to come out. Infection is another hallmark of cystic fibrosis. Infection occurs early. Uh, once it becomes present, it remains chronic. Uh, this is a typical way in which we look at the infectious data that we get from our CF patient registry. This is looking at the whole population of CF patients. As patients get older, what you see is Pseudomonas aeruginosa becomes the biggest, most common organism that we see. But we see a multitude of other bugs, including Staph, Haemophilus, Stenotrophomonas, Burkholderia, Acinetobacter, Acromobacter. When we teach this on the wards, our, our students are just amazed at how many bugs that they see or that we see in our cultures of our patients. I turn that around and say, but there are so many more bugs. And what's far more interesting is why is it this collection and not others? And that's something that we take in terms of our trying to understand how best to treat folks. And then the third component is the inflammation. The body responds to this infection with inflammation, which is a good thing, but like many other things in life, too much of a good thing is a bad thing, and the inflammation in cystic fibrosis is exaggerated. And so you're looking at material taken from a, through a bronchoscopy coming from the lower airways, and this is what you would see in a healthy child, and you see there's not a lot of cells, not a lot of purple up here, and the most common type of cell is an alveolar macrophage. When you do a lavage in a CF patient, you see a lot of cells, tremendous number of cells, and the predominant uh, white cell is the neutrophil, is coming in to fight the infection. And the problem is, is that the weapons that the neutrophil uses to kill bacteria is unfortunately harmful to normal tissues, and there's so much of it, it's causing injury to the airways. And so the reality is these three different problems are all working with each other, against each other, if you have obstruction, it's hard to clear out that infectious material, which brings on more inflammation, which causes edema, which now makes for further obstruction, and so forth. And so that progression leads on to progressive irreversible lung damage, and unfortunately that is the way that most of our patients with CF die, is because of respiratory disease. So that's the basic pathogenesis, the model that we use when we start thinking about drug development. Back in 2007, we published our first set of guidelines to talk about the therapies that we recommend for use in the treatment of lung disease. And as I told you, there wasn't anything when I got started in this business, and now we have a whole multitude of drugs that we recommend for treatment of patients, some in which we do not recommend as routine use, and there are others that are typically or frequently used, but we don't have the evidence to support that. These guidelines were just recently updated to include some medications that were not available uh, in the previous set of guidelines, and then some additional refinement of some of the information. So we have a whole bunch of different medications that we have available to treat our patients, but one of the problems is, is that these medications, where you look at where they target the basic underlying pathophysiology, are unfortunately all dealing with what we would call downstream effects, the sequelae of CF lung disease. They're not treating the early basic defect. They're treating the problems, the infection, the obstruction, the inflammation. They've been very effective, and that's why we've seen improvement in the health and the lifespan of our patients, but we would really like to get at the basic defect. So if we really wanted to talk about a cure, then we'd really want to try to get to replacing the gene or fixing the gene. Other strategies have been talked about is to bypass the function of CFTR and 
essentially restore the airway surface liquid using other mechanisms, or can we just fix that CFTR defect? And so all of these strategies would be geared towards that basic problem, and our hope is if we treat these upstream problems, we won't see quite the severity of the downstream effects. So let's just talk a little bit about the gene theory of replacing the gene. Uh, this showed great promise. A tremendous amount of work had been done trying to get towards gene therapy, and a great deal was learned. I don't want anyone to think that we didn't learn a lot from this, but I'm going to be very brief about that because we're down to the last trial. The last active trial looking at the potential benefits of gene therapy is being done in the UK right now. They've completed enrollment looking at the potential clinical benefits of gene therapy and their expected uh, date of completion is in 2014. There are still people interested in gene modification, but we recognize that there were problems that were going to be very, very difficult to clear, which required investment in other strategies. How about bypassing the effects of CFTR and essentially using other channels to try and stimulate and replace that airway surface liquid? And some that have been talked about is to block that sodium channel. So chloride can't get out, sodium's being absorbed too much of it, and where salt goes, so goes water. So if we could block that sodium channel, then maybe we could have a benefit there. And early attempts at doing this have not been very successful, in part because the drugs have such a short half-life that they don't stick around long enough to make enough of a difference. And then there have been attempts to try and stimulate other channels, these calcium uh, chloride channels, and that's still very early in development. We had a drug that we thought might get there. Again, it had a very, very short half-life and so has not found its way into our uh, list of therapies. But what about correcting the CFTR mutation? And now we're talking about CFTR modulators. And this is the area, everyone has heard Kaleidico, uh, this is the area in which I want to talk uh, next. What you're seeing here is a video that was produced by Vertex that talks a bit about how proteins are made. So here's the DNA, and a copy of the gene is made, it's spliced, and from that, that's our copy in which we're going to make a protein. So that message RNA goes out uh, to the ribosome, the ribosome reads that message and creates a protein. But that protein's immature, it has to be folded, it has to have some things added to it, that happens in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then from there, it gets transported up to the Golgi complex, and then from there, it works its way up to the top of the cell. That's what's normal CF, or protein development. So here is the surface of the airway. These are the CFTR proteins, and you can see the little chlorides coming through that. So there's a lot of things that have to happen to make normal protein and get it to where it's going to go. So if we're going to modulate that, we have a couple of different strategies. Now remember, I broke these into two general categories. There are those gene mutations which don't make protein, and there are gene mutations that make protein, but they don't function right. So let's first start talking about those, and to try to make them work, we're going to potentiate them. We're going to kick them up a notch, if you will and make them work a little bit better, and this is where Ivacaftor or Kaleidico comes into play. There are a number of mutations that have a problem with the gating. So here's the CF protein, but that channel, the gate has to open in order for chloride to flow through. So when you look at the top of the cell in patients who have the G551D mutation, they have plenty protein. It's being made, but nothing's flowing through it because the gate's not opening like it should. So we need to develop a strategy to try and fix that. And that's where Ivacaftor came into play. Think of it like uh, opening your screen door and sticking a rock in there so it stays open so your kids can flow in and out through that channel. And so I'm going to give you very briefly some of the data that were the resultant from our clinical trials of Kaleidico in patients with the G551D mutation. So as you know, one of the problems in CF is the sweat test is abnormal. And so this was looked at in patients on Kaleidico, and what you see here is looking at the change in sweat chloride on drug, comparing drug, which is down here, to placebo. And so as you might expect, if you're taking a placebo, which is not drug, you would not expect a change in the sweat chloride, and that's what you see here. And the patients who took Kaleidico saw a marked drop in their sweat chloride down to about 
um, a drop of about 50 millimoles per liter. Now, why do we see that? Because the sweat gland, the CF protein is very important. When you have the sweat gland, you have two parts. This is the secretory part. So when you need to sweat, your nerves stimulate those glands, and you make sweat, and it has the same salt concentration as you have in your blood. It's what we call isotonic sweat. As that sweat moves through this absorptive duct towards the surface of the skin, the salt gets reabsorbed through a CFTR. And the reason for that is the purpose of sweating is to get rid of heat, not to get rid of salt. So you want to absorb all the salt, get the fluid to the surface, and let it evaporate, and that's how you get rid of heat. So the sweat normally should have a very low concentration of chloride in it. And so here's an example. Those patients started out with an abnormal sweat chloride of about 100. On um, placebo, didn't change. And those who got colitico, their sweat chloride dropped to about 50 millimoles uh, per liter. And when we look at how we define abnormal tests, a normal sweat chloride is less than 40, and greater than 60 is compatible with the diagnosis of CF. So it's not normal, but it's a considerable improvement uh, in the sweat chloride of those patients. Well, you don't get a drug approved at the FDA because you lowered sweat chloride. That's not going to happen. So you've got to have another clinical outcome. And for many of our studies, we have always looked at lung function. And so this is looking at lung function, looking at the FEV1, that forced expiratory volume at one second. This is the absolute change of percent predicted lung function. Placebo did not change. If anything, it dropped a little bit. And the patients who are on Colatico saw about a 10% improvement that was sustained over that period of time while they're on drug. Huge home run, very exciting, and went to the FDA. But there were other benefits that were realized. This is looking at pulmonary exacerbations, which, as you all know, are another common occurrence in patients with CF. And what you see here is that the patients on placebo, the likelihood of them not having an exacerbation was much lower. So there was a big difference between the frequency of exacerbations in those on drug compared to placebo. This is looking at quality of life. Quality of life was improved in those patients who were on Ivacaftor compared to on placebo. And another observation was they gained weight. Now, we still don't know whether they gained weight because there was less inflammation, so they weren't burning so many calories. Their appetite was improved. Maybe it's an appetite stimulant. Maybe it has better absorption in the GI tract. We're trying to understand all those benefits that are there, but these are all, everything's in the right direction. And that's what led to the approval of Kaleidico. So Ivacaftor was approved for patients who have the G551D mutation. The problem we have is that if we look at the frequency of that gene mutation, Every one of these dots is a different percent of all the CF patients. So if we could put all those who have G551D over the age of six, that gets 4% of the population are benefiting from that drug. So that's terrific, but it's not enough. So we have many questions. Would earlier treatment prevent CF lung disease? If I make the argument that we should be treating earlier as we can, then wouldn't we really want to treat those kids as soon as we knew that diagnosis was there before they develop infection, before inflammation starts to kick in? So what might we expect if we began treatment even earlier? So I showed you this slide that sweat chloride came down to a level of less than 60. If we look at the relationship of sweat chloride relative to the severity of disease, there is a relationship that we begin to see. So on this axis, we're looking at the CFTR activity. How active, how much towards normal is that CFTR working? And so here we have 100% of activity, and the sweat chloride is normally less than 40. It's about 20 millimoles per liter. As you look at carriers, they don't have quite as much normal CFTR activity. Then you get to this non-classical CF, and then milder forms and more severe forms. So there is a relationship between the severity of sweat chloride and lung function that we see in our patients. And we have some data looking at patients who were diagnosed with these seemingly milder manifestations. So at the age of diagnosis, I'm looking at those patients who have cystic fibrosis and pancreatic insufficiency. These are the kids we identify now at birth, very young. And comparing those to those who have CFTR dysfunction, much milder manifestation, 
the age of diagnosis of less than one year to 11 years, the sweat chloride is much lower, their lung function is much better, the chance of them having infection is much lower, and other manifestations like clubbing was less. So it's not a cure, but if we can make it that much better for those kids growing up, that is a huge benefit for those patients. Will have a CAFTR work for other CFG mutations? So it works for G551D, which is a gating mutation abnormality. So it really ought to work in other uh, genes that cause gating mutations. In this particular slide, I'm looking at a number of CFTR gene mutations. These are all gating mutations. This is normal here on the left. There's G551D. And what I'm looking at here is the channel open probability. So baseline is in the white bar. So this is how often that channel is working, opening, letting chloride flow through it under normal circumstances. So that's normal. And the important thing here is if I hit normal CFTR with Ivacaftor, it kicks it up as well. So as an aside, we can start entertaining questions about whether this drug might have benefits in people without cystic fibrosis. If you look right next to it, G551D had, it was an opening, and it kicks up, not even to normal. But that's enough to make that clinical difference. And so if you look at these other uh, mutations that are gating mutations, you would predict that these all should respond in a similar way. And so we actually have just finished enrollment of the study, looking at other mutations that are similar to G551D, those data are being analyzed, and our hope is that we would be able to expand the indication to these other gene mutations. That gets us to 5% if we can get those kids down to age 2 and those other gating mutations. Again, they're not frequent. Again, it helps those patients, but we want to go even further. There's another category of mutations where the gating is okay, but the channel is narrow, and R117H is a classic description of one of those categories of mutations. As I showed you, Ivacaftor kicks normal CFTR, so maybe we can kick that one and we can make a difference. And we are doing an active study right now in patients with R117H uh, nearing completion of enrollment, and our hopes is that we will be able to see similar benefits. That gets us up to 7% of the population. So we still have a lot to do. Well, if we really want to hit a home run, the most common mutation is Delta F508. Delta 508 accounts for two-thirds of the gene mutations out there. And so if you look at the population who have two copies of Delta 508, it's nearly half of our CF patients. Those who have one copy is another almost 40%. So that's the one we really want to work on. So we tested Ivacaftor in Delta 508. However, we knew full well this was not going to work. But we had some very important questions to answer and it's why we looked at Delta F508. Why wouldn't it work? Because the problem in Delta F508 is that process of folding the protein. It doesn't fold like it's supposed to, and so it never gets through that trafficking step. So if you don't have protein at the top of the cell, Ivacaptor's not going to add anything. So if you look at this slide, this is looking at the amount of CFTR uh, maturation in the normal situation, you have this much CFTR in Delta F508, you have very little. There's not enough up there that we need to try and work. So if we're going to fix that, we got to find a way to correct it to get that protein up to the top of the cell. And we actually have a number of these correctors in the pipeline. I'm going to talk only about two of those. That's VX809, now known as Lumacaftor, and VX661. And the reason is that we have more data on those. So as I told you, when you're making the protein, the message goes in, you make that protein in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then it should be processed on from out of there. And so if you look at this gel, which is looking at normal CFTR compared to delta F508, and looking what's in the cell surface, it's all in there, there's none of it in the endoplasmic reticulum, but in delta F508, it's all there. None of it's getting to the cell surface. So if you expose it to a corrector and try to increase getting, some of that getting to the cell surface, you can see we're starting to see some of that getting up to the cell surface. It's not normal. 
But remember, Ivacaftor didn't make G551D normal. Normal isn't necessary. The question is, is it going to be good enough? And so looking at it electrically, we had to look at activity with 809, at Lumacaftor, we can increase the amount of CFTR activity, in this case, to about 15% of what's normal. And that seems to be the ceiling that we're hitting. And actually, one of the things that we believe the ultimate future is that we're going to need two drugs to try and get adequate amount of CFTR. But you've got to build it one step at a time. So here's looking at some clinical data of treating patients with um, monotherapy, meaning just the lumacaftor. And what you see, looking at the change in sweat chloride at low doses and increasing the dose, we start to see further reductions in sweat chloride. That's all great news. Just to put uh, some relevance to that, you can see the changes in the range of 7 to 8 millimoles. It's not like Ivacaftor was for G551D, which was a 50 millimole difference. That's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect, but the question is, is it good enough? The second thing we learned in our uh, studies in Delta F508 is that Delta F508 does respond to Ivacaftor. If the protein gets to the cell surface, you can do kick it up with Ivacaftor. So now we're thinking of a two-drug combination, a corrector to try to increase the amount of protein, and then give it a potentiator to kick it up. And so it's, this doesn't project very well, but this is looking at increasing doses of our drug and looking at CFTR activity. If we just give the corrector, we start to see some improvement. If we then add Ivacaftor, we knock it up another notch. So now the question is, is that enough? Is that going to be enough to see a clinical difference? And that led to our phase two studies, looking at trying to find how to plan the phase three studies, the ultimate trials. I'm not going to bore you with the details of all these, but what you see is that we treated patients with one drug, just the Lumacaftor, and then we added the Ivacaftor, and what we did was keep increasing the doses because we had to try to find what was the drug dose that we were going to work with in terms of uh, our phase three studies. We also tested it in people who had just one copy of Delta F508 to see if they were going to realize enough improvement. The phase three design essentially has just gone into the homozygous patients. Uh, I'm not going to show you all the data leading to this, but this is looking at changes in lung function during the time when there was just the lumacaftor, just monotherapy, there was no improvement in lung function, actually a slight drop. Then when ivacaftor was added, there was a bump. And so you see the difference compared to those patients on placebo, and that was enough to convince the company to proceed with phase three studies. And so where we are now is we are actively enrolling in our phase three study looking at Lumacaftor, or VX809, plus Ivacaftor in patients who are homozygous for Delta F508. To do these studies, you have to have at least two to convince the FDA that you get consistent results. Because of the nature of these studies, they have to be very large. We need 500 patients in each study. So we're about a third of the way through with enrollment. I hope we're able to finish enrollment before the end of the year, uh, and it's a year-long study. VX661 is the other corrector, which just recently completed one of our phase two cohorts, using it with and without Ivacaftor in patients homozygous for Delta F508. And there was a recent press release uh, that came out. These are not published data. This was a press release in April. And looking at increasing doses of the VX661, what you're seeing is the absolute change in lung function went up um, actually to a greater amount than we saw with the Lumacaftor in the phase two studies. That's also very exciting news, and we're going to finish our next cohort of patients, including patients who have one copy of Delta F508. Keep in mind, these are small numbers of patients, so we have a long way to go to try and get that one across the finish line. So if this works, and we can treat patients homozygous for Delta F508, because that's how the label will read, then we're adding another 50% of patients. And if we could make it work for those who are heterozygous, now we've got 90% of the patients who could potentially benefit from therapy like this. That's a huge home run. There's such excitement about this that uh, many companies in pharma have demonstrated an interest in this, ranging from small companies to very large pharma. You can see Pfizer 
I'm not going to talk about all these different methods of trying to find these correctors and potentiators, but it has become a very hot area, and we're going to see further generation development of these uh, drugs that will be probably even more um, uh, efficient at working. So it's a very exciting time uh, for our patients. So what else is in the pipeline? What else have we got beyond CFTR modulation? So I want to talk briefly about mannitol. Mannitol would be uh, here to try and relieve obstruction for clearing airway secretions or potentially trying to deal with that reduction in airway surface liquid. Mannitol is a sugar alcohol, and we use it in our patients to try and pull fluid, uh, typically intravenously, uh, to try and pull fluid out of tissues. Uh, so for example, if someone has a brain injury, we're trying to reduce the edema there. So we've been looking at trying to use a dry powder form of mannitol by the inhaled route to pull fluid in to try and augment clearance of uh, secretions. And so I'm showing here very briefly some data that were published with Mora as the first author of this paper, looking at inhaled mannitol in patients with cystic fibrosis. And what you see here is that on those who got mannitol, there was an increase in lung function that was clinically relevant. Now, the control also went up, but the control isn't a placebo in the usual sense. The control here was just a smaller dose of mannitol. So that makes it very difficult to try and get it um, uh, to convince the FDA that that is a meaningful benefit. But you can see here, here was the original data I just showed you, and then there was an open label phase. So you can see that there was a consistent maintenance of lung function and an improvement in those who had additionally been on the control. Uh, this has now been approved in Australia. It's been approved in Europe in the adult population. It unfortunately did not get approved yet by the FDA, and there is a negotiation to try and see if we can get it approved for adults uh, with cystic fibrosis. Uh, and that uh, hopefully will be forthcoming soon. What about antibiotics? Infection is such a big deal in these patients. Do we need more antibiotic choices? Do we need to change our strategy of treatment in these patients? So these are the products that we have available to us right now. So you can see it essentially consists of tobramycin and uh, aztreonam. And we now have a different formulations. So we have uh, aerosol formulations with Toby and with Bethkiss. We have a new powder uh, preparation uh, in um, the Toby Pod Haler, and then we have um, Kasten. And then we also still use some drugs in an off-label development. So one can ask, do we need uh, more choices? Do we, do we need to have other drugs available to us? Do we have the optimal regimen? Should we exercise the same strategy that we do for Pseudomonas for other pathogens? And those are the questions that we're trying to tease out. So in the antibiotic pipeline, uh, there are studies looking at liposomal amicacin, so it's another aminoglycoside, and then we've been looking at quinolones, levofloxacin aerosol is the furthest along uh, and is now being prepared for approval in the European uh, agency and in further negotiation with the FDA to try and see if we can get that one across. The problem we had there was that the, the two phase three studies, the first one didn't hit its mark and the second one did. And so trying to understand how are we going to make that uh, work. Do we have the right regimen? The way antibiotics are developed or have been developed is in this month on, month off paradigm. It's a long story to tell you why that was done, but the fact is, is that many of us don't believe that's the right regimen that our patients don't feel as well in the off period. And so we can ask, is it better to just give continuous inhaled antibiotics? And we could do that in one of a couple ways. We could use the same drug continuously, or we should maybe use continuous antibiotics, but we should rotate those choices. And those are two very different questions. And what we have elected to do is this particular trial, which is actively enrolling. And in this study, everybody gets inhaled tobramycin for three cycles every other month. And that is open label, meaning the patients know they're getting inhaled tobramycin. And then in the in-between months, they're either getting astreonam or placebo, and that they're blinded to. Because what we want to try and do is demonstrate that this is the right regimen. And uh, for those of you who might already be on a regimen like this, realize that we have to fight daily with the insurance companies to get them to pay. And so what we really want to do is have the data to support uh, what we are recommending. And then the question is, what's the right strategy for different bugs? 
So the drugs that I've just talked about with uh, tobramycin or ACE Tranem are intended to treat patients who have pseudomonas. So we feel reasonably confident with our strategy of using chronic inhaled antibiotics to suppress uh, chronic pseudomonas infection. And actually, we've employed that as an eradication strategy for patients who have their first or early infection with pseudomonas. We do not currently recommend it for prophylaxis. So what about other bugs? Should we do the same thing in staph? Now, our guidelines do not recommend prophylaxis against uh, staph, but should we be using it to try and treat these patients? There are some recent data to, to demonstrate that these bugs might be worse than we thought. What about stenotrophomonas? How about Burkholderia? Burkholderia gets a lot of press as being a bad bug. Should we try and eradicate it? There are people who are developing an eradication protocol strategy. We have one study that didn't show benefit for chronic suppression, but there were some problems in the design of that study, and so we still don't know whether that's the right strategy. And then now we're all focusing on mycobacteria. Should we take an eradication approach and so forth? So where we are now is now we're going to focus on staph, and particularly MRSA. And we are in the midst of doing a study, a phase two study, of a vancomycin product, a powder product, uh, in which we're trying to see if there's evidence that suppression of MRSA is actually going to be of benefit. And I know of two investigators who are writing a protocol for or an eradication protocol for, um, for staph. And then finally, we get to inflammation. I showed you this slide earlier that the inflammation in CF is exaggerated and the neutrophil is the culprit. And so the problem is that inflammation is causing injury to the airways. And in a number of products, neutrophil elastase is the one that probably is the best correlate in terms of understanding how much inflammation there is. And not only does it do damage, but it's recruiting more inflammation to the, to the area. So it's just fostering itself for more injury. And so there's a number of strategies that we've been looking at to try and affect that. We use chronic macrolides like azithromycin because it suppresses inflammation. Ibuprofen has been used in younger patients. And there is a new molecule that inhibits the migration of the neutrophils into the airways. Early phase study, so it's very, very premature, and we'll see if that proceeds on to further development. And the other one is to try and inhibit the neutrophil elastase using alpha-1 antitrypsin. Alpha-1, you make it. It is normally in your airways. You make it in your liver. It is part of your normal defense against your own inflammatory processes. So the question is, if the, if the inflammation is exaggerated and there's too much of it, it's overwhelming your protection, so perhaps we could augment that. This actually is not novel. It was done back in the 1990s of aerosolizing alpha-1 to get it into the airways. And the problem was we just couldn't get enough in there. But now we have newer devices, more efficient nebulizers, and an improved product. And so we're in the middle of a phase two study looking at aerosolization of alpha-1 atrypsin to see if we can demonstrate we can suppress the inflammation going on. That is still in very early development, and I'm hoping we can finish that study uh, very soon. So here we are over in the inflammation side and talking about alpha-1. But I want to mention another novel product, a different strategy completely, um, and how we're going to be looking at that. So Pseudomonas does its harm by something we call type 3 secretion. And the way I want you to think of this is Pseudomonas is walking around with this needle on it. And the way it does harm to the cells is it injects it into the cells, and those enzymes that it releases causes destruction inside the cell, and now it has to invest all of its energy to repair itself. While it's doing that, Pseudomonas can start growing and multiplying. So here you see Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It has this needle through this type 3 secretion, and it's shooting in its uh, enzymes, these exotoxins that are causing harm to the cell. So there have been a lot of work looking at vaccines or antibody approaches to treating pseudomonas, targeting other areas, but now there is an approach to try and target that. Think of it like capping the needle. So it's not really intended to kill the bacteria. It's not an antibiotic in that sense. But the way that we think pseudomonas causes progressive injury to the airways is it moves from one area to the next and it injures the airways. So adding antibiotics in that case help, but the injury's already taken place. And so maybe we can find a way to let them have pseudomonas be there, but it's just rendered harmless. And so we're in the middle of a phase two study 
testing this, and what's novel about this is also how do we actually analyze it? What are we going to measure that we can take to the FDA? So we've gone through a lot of material. There is a handout that contains the pipeline. I see many of you have it on your table, and I've talked about most of the products that are on that pipeline in terms of where we are, but it's a very exciting time. I think we've made huge progress. We now have a number of therapies available to us to treat our patients, and yet as proud as we are of improvement and survival, our patients still die too young. So we have to do better. We either have to get new drugs or we have to use these drugs more efficiently. So these new therapies are a real boost because now we're not only getting to the basic defect, but now we're starting to look at personalized medication. That this therapy isn't for everybody, but it's for you. This is the therapy that we're recommending for you based upon your problems. And this is the target, this is the promise that the CF Foundation has given that we're not going to stop at Delta F508. We've got to find those other 10% to make sure that we've got some strategy of correcting those CFTR uh, mutations. But until then, we still have to take care of all of the other problems that our patients have, and we have to keep thinking of novel approaches. And not just new therapies, but as Mark suggested last night, using these therapies more effectively. And this is getting into the era of what we call comparative effectiveness. How do these therapies work in real life, in real practice? And I'm happy to say the CF Foundation is now funding another one of our uh, proposals where we're going to develop a comparative effectiveness strategy and we're starting off with how we treat uh, CF pulmonary exacerbations, which I hope that we will launch in December of this year. And with that, I think I've left you plenty of time. I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Flynn. That was inspiring. I'm very hopeful as a parent of a double Delta F508. I'm looking forward to, to the new medications coming online. So now's the time for questions. The microphone will be here. We ask that you limit your questions to one per person. The microphone is also going to be sterilized between use. We have a lovely volunteer doing that for us, so please proceed. Hello. Wow. He's good, isn't he? <laughs> How can us carriers participate in some trials? Aren't there some measurements that can be done on those of us who carry the gene? The Delta 50F? I've got one. So we, um, we've learned things from carriers, and um, although we always say that carriers can't have disease, we often find people who have manifestations similar to what we see in CF in patients who we can only identify one mutation. So there clearly are other genes that are at play. And so there has been aggressive looking at, well, what are those gene modifiers which might help us understand how come this person has severe disease and this person has mild disease? But at the moment, uh, we're using carriers primarily to help us understand what those gene modifiers would be, not in terms of a therapeutic approach. So where you can help, um, the greatest frustration that we experience as researchers, and I know as parents, is these things take too long. That we come forward and we say, look at this, I've got great promise, and then it takes us years to get these studies finished. And so what we try to do with our research centers is help them to try and be more efficient, to overcome the bureaucratic hurdles that we have to get our studies up and going. But the other piece that when we talk to our study sites is recruit, recruit, recruit because I know what it's like for patients who participate in a trial and then it takes us a year and a half to finish and they're always going, whatever happened with that study? And so that's our greatest urgency. So uh, enrollment is key and that's why we try to communicate that to all of our patients and families of what the opportunities are, what they might be interested in participating in. Um, Manitol, my concern is how have you made it so that it isn't harmful as well as helpful? Because don't bacteria breed in sugars, feed on sugars, and you, we're putting sugar alcohol into our lungs? So how does 
one negate the other or what? Right. So um, there can be concerns that are we just feeding these bugs? And the answer is they don't utilize mannitol quite the way they would other sugars. And secondly, it's not present long enough for it to, to do much. We talk about it as enhancing mucosillary clearance, which might be partly how it works. It may be that it really is most effective at cough clearance, and so you're getting that benefit. Uh, in my book, um, I don't care how it works, if it works. Um, one of the issues that was raised in the FDA is they were concerned about it inducing hemoptysis, and uh, particularly in young children. And it turned out the incidence of that is actually quite low. And um, so now what we're trying to do is help educate the community as to the frequency of hemoptysis. When I say hemoptysis, I'm saying coughing up blood. I'm assuming probably most people know what that is like. Um, and that we as clinicians and you as families, we talk and know how to manage that. So their concern was just the benefits were far more evident in the adult population than they were in the very young. And with this perceived potential risk, maybe we should just start working on it like the Europeans did and get it available for the adult patients. Thank you. Sorry I cheated, I asked Tara how that thing worked. It looks really cool. But anyway, um, also about mannitol and also in general, have you been comparing different meds against each other? So for example, there's hypertonic saline, which does the same thing as mannitol, so is like one more effective, is one, does it taste better or something? Or? So the, the um, just talk a little bit about drug development. Uh, when you are developing a drug and you want to go to the FDA to get this approved, you have to compare it to something so that they have reasonable evidence that the drug is effective and safe. So for many of these drugs, there was nothing to compare it to. So everything that you see that we have approved has been compared to placebo. And now that we have a number of drugs, and the question comes, that, do I need to be on every one of these drugs? Do I need to be on pulmosyme, hypertonic, saline, tobramycin, macrolides, ibuprofen? Or is there some other combination? What can I give up? And that's where compared effectiveness comes into play. So actually, in the mannitol studies, the FDA required them not to be on hypertonic saline. So that was a specific requirement to be in the study. With hypertonic saline, there, it comes with its baggage. You're sitting there at a nebulizer. It takes time. Some people can't tolerate it. So when you go to mannitol, it's portable. You can take it with you. Um, some people can't tolerate dry powders. Um, my bias is I'm not trying to prove which is the absolute best. What I want to find is what's going to work for that patient. And if that patient says, I don't like hypertonic saline, but I will like this mannitol, then that's fine. Because what we do know is that doing something works better than doing nothing. Hi, Doctor. Great presentation. Hadn't seen those graphics before. Those are pretty neat. Could you speak on the stop codone, um, in particular, um, the good and the bad of Atoluron? mixed reviews between Birmingham and Jerusalem and anything else that might be out there in the pipeline right. to work? So what, what, what is meant by a stop codon, so when we look at our mutations, we break them into general categories. And so I simplified in those that don't make protein and those that do, but it is more complicated. So when you saw the protein synthesis and when you're reading off your protein, you need to come to a point where you're reading your gene and it says, period, end of sentence. Stop. And that happens normally. That's what you want to have. But if the mutation makes it look like there's a period too soon, then what you're going to end up with is a truncated protein. We call it nonsense. It's not going to do anything. So to fix that, you need to have something that knows how to read through that false period. And so there are a number of drugs that have been looked at. Gentamicin would be one example. And atelurin was one that got the furthest along into phase three studies. This was based upon some positive results coming out of Israel that unfortunately weren't duplicated anywhere else and yet went on to a phase three study. And it didn't work. Um, there was no difference in benefits. And since that time, people have tried to do subgroup analyses to say, well, it didn't work in the people who were on inhaled tobramycin, and, and maybe that was inhibiting that. Uh, my own personal bias is that's going to be a dead end and that adalurin is not going to be the product that's going to be there for us. And so we're looking at new strategies, and the problem with genomycin is it has comes with toxicity. 
And so the amount of drug that you need to try and get you a complete read through there is, is a problem. So there is active data being developed, but it's not anywhere near uh, human trials in terms of future products. Uh, that was a great talk, Patrick. Uh, I actually really like the transcription, translation um, renderings that you had. Um, but I have a question about VX809. Mm -hmm. So this facilitates the delivery of Delta F508 to the cell surface. So I was wondering what its target was. Is this inhibiting something like ER-associated degradation, or is it more specific? And once Delta F508 gets to the surface, is it stable there, or is it rapidly endocytosed? Uh, what's the half-life of the protein under drug treatment? Right. So there's a number of targets. If, what I didn't show in here is if you just look at that trafficking after you've begun the folding process and how many steps, there's about 12 steps along the way where something could go wrong. And so this is looking at binding and folding in the um, in domain of the endoplasmic reticulum. So it's actually not even in the trafficking part after that. There are other products that are further along, and that's why, at least in the laboratory, combinations of these products you actually can see much greater yield of CFTR. The second thing is, is that when you make a protein, it doesn't made forever. It has a, a time that it's going to be there, and it does um, essentially go away. It gets endocytosed. You go up and clear it off. And so you've got this constant circulation. And the sad reality is it does have a shorter time. Um, it doesn't stay in there as, as long enough. Um, and there have been a number of processes looking at uh, ways to try and improve that, to basically inhibit that degradation pathway. Um, there are a number of products that are looking at uh, inhibiting those. Um, those haven't been discussed that I'm aware of in terms of adding into these trials. The first question is, can you get enough improvement with the strategy we have now to be able to get that to your next platform, which is now add another agent to that, either to increase CFTR or to in increase its time? I was wondering um, if someone ha has adverse reactions to ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin orally or by IV, can they benefit from the inhaled form or is it also contraindicated? So it depends upon what the reaction is. If An someone arthritic reaction is what I'm specifically. A what kind of reaction? Arthritic. So arthritic, um, the answer is I don't know to that one. So the dose that we were using with inhaled levofloxacin, some of that gets absorbed and gets into the system. So you could have some sequelae of side effects in there. But it's the equivalent of taking a 250 milligram pill. And as you may recall, when we use it orally, we're using up doses upwards of 750 to 1,000 milligrams, sometimes twice a day. So my belief is that we'll see fewer problems with nausea and joint problems, but I don't know that it'll be totally ameliorated. If it was truly an allergic reaction, then it would, you couldn't use it by the inhaled route. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, my question has to do with just the progressive nature of particularly even lung function. And obviously this, the pipeline and this, the growing family of drugs will benefit somebody who's one very differently than somebody who's 30. So I was wondering if you could just comment on what are the, gonna be the actual life benefits for people who are between the ages of 1 and 15, 15 and 30, and 30 and above. So these are questions that we get to speculate on in trying to imagine what life would be like. So as I showed you on the one slide, what would happen if you take someone from having severe CFTR problems where you have severe full-blown CF to now this sort of more like CFTR dysfunction with our sweat chloride is in the 50 range. So we can try to talk about if you treat a one-year-old with a drug like Ivacaptor, and we'll just assume that there's no long-term new problem that would occur you know, with long-term treatment, what might we anticipate? And those of us who take care of adults, uh, we continue to find some patients who have gone through life with CF but weren't diagnosed until they were 30 or 40 years old. Uh, my oldest that I diagnosed was 72. Um, it's awfully hard to think we would have made a big difference in that person's life. But if I could, if we didn't have newborn screening, but we do, so we're definitely want to diagnose them. But if we started, if I could pr push the clinical manifestations that would have otherwise led to a diagnosis of CF, 
to age 15 or age 30. That's adding, I think, a lot in terms of what they have to look forward to. And keep in mind that a child born today has a very different future than someone born 20 years ago in terms of prediction. Now, the other reality, if you look at the drugs that we develop, look at that median age or that mean age of the patients that we're treating. Look back to what it was in Pulmosyme and Tobermyosin when they were first developed. So then, back then, the median age was like 16 to 18 in those trials. And now you're seeing us do studies in people who are 30. So we're finding those clinical benefits in those patients who already have established disease. And in fact, there was a, a presentation at the European CF meeting uh, that I think has been submitted for publication demonstrating that even patients with very severe impairment, with FEV1s that are in the 30% range, are benefiting from a drug like Ivacaftor. So we don't know. Now, the question we always face with our patients is, OK, doc, I'll take this. What can I stop? And our advice at the beginning is don't stop anything, because that's not the way we did the study. So we don't know what the harm is. And the last thing we want to do is replace one drug that costs a lot so you can take away these other drugs, which also cost a lot, but it's a wash in terms of benefit. So we do look forward to the day where we can say with confidence, I think you can stop that drug now. But our, when we initiate these therapies, um, they still have chronic infection. They still have too much inflammation. That isn't cured by this. So my question is about the people that I know that are getting access to Kaleidico. And most of them are getting, and I don't, you know, when I find out that somebody's getting Kaleidico, I'm just thrilled for my, you know, friend's child or whatever. So I don't really know mutations per se. But um, the thing that I'm noticing is that usually who is a, who's ever qualifying to get it is quite sick and that that's why they're getting it which kind of goes counter to what you were saying at the beginning, which is that you, this, is, this is kind of turning into a drug that is instead a drug of last resort rather than that what, you, you know, what you were, your first premise was, which is that let's get this before the kids get so sick. But these are adults who are, say, you know, pre-transplant and it's sort of a, a drug of last resort. I'm just wondering, once those kids get that drug, I'm assuming that they're not the, the G551 people, that once those kids get those drugs, do you then continue to follow them and track their mutations and see how that mutation is being affected by the drug and collecting that data? So the mutation won't be changed. They will have the same mutation before and after. So what's different, and the protein's not changed, what we're doing is kicking it up, opening it up so it works, it potentiates, it makes it more active. So when the drug was approved, it was approved for patients with CF who are over the age of six and who have a G551D mutation. And so that's how it was prescribed. And it wasn't just for patients who had more severe impairment. And so immediately there was over an 80% uptake in the patients who had that mutation. So it was a tremendous success getting the drug out there for patients. Amazingly, we called a Medicaid to think, we thought this is gonna require prior authorization because it's an expensive drug. And they said, no, 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 no. You don't need a prior authorization. I do for prednisone, which is pennies, but not for Kaleidico. <laughs> so it wasn't indicated for anyone under the age of six. And yet I do know there are some patients under the age of six who are getting the drug because the physicians appealed to the insurance company to begin treatment. And I'm also aware of some patients who have other gating mutations in which the drug has been approved, mm -hmm. in which the insurance company could have said no. They could have said, this is the, the box that we're going to follow. Those are the rules. But they did decide to go ahead and treat those patients. We are actively studying younger kids. And what the FDA requires when you want to go in younger kids is identifying other potential safety issues. So one of those, if you want to treat infants with Kaleidico, we had to study animals through, uh, you know, prenatal, neonatal. I mean, what we found was that rodents develop cataracts. Now, one can ask, what does the development of the rodent eye have to do with us? But what we had to do then is start screening our patients for cataracts. And we're going to monitor that over time. What that has done is the patients who have any signs of early cataract development are not eligible for participation in the trials, at least not yet. 
And so in some of our studies where our patients are over the age of 45, we've had to not allow a couple of those patients to get into the studies. And I want to share just a couple of their comments about the systemic benefits of, of uh, Ivacaftor. Um, again, it's a systemic drug. It's not like an aerosol therapy where you're just trying to get it into the lungs. And I showed you issues with nutrition and so forth. But one of the other issues in, in CF in the female is a perception there is reduced fertility because the cervical mucus is abnormal and might function as a plug. And we've had essentially, uh, I have knowledge now of two women who have become pregnant since starting the drug. Uh, one in the study and one actually after the drug was released. And one of those had been unsuccessful for 10 years before. And one month after starting drugs, she got pregnant. <laughs> so so it, it gives us great excitement to start asking questions like what's going to happen in the liver? Uh, if patients still have some pancreatic function, will that preserve them? Is it going to help them with delaying time to diabetes? There's lots of fun questions that we get to start thinking about. Uh, we have time for two more questions. So if you have uh, one question, line up here behind, and then um, you can ask further questions on Sunday. Good morning. First of all, it is such a joy to hear a very technical person such as yourself talk to us lay people in such simple terms. So I really want to thank you for that. Really. Thank you. And secondly, this is uh, specific to my niece who has a mutation in the same class as the Delta F508. How confident are you that um, these drugs that are targeting Delta F508 will work for mutations in that same class? So one of the things you learn when you do clinical trials is be cautious about being overconfident. And this is why we do trials. If we knew that the drug was going to work, there'd be no point in doing them. But you do this long enough and you get to the finish line and you break your data open and you see what happens and it doesn't work. Then comes the hard work. You either have to figure out that your drug isn't ever gonna work or we did something wrong with the study design. And that's why it's so terribly important that we pay attention and we do it right. Because you'd hate to lose a drug because you failed to design it correctly. I have not seen the data in looking at other class three mutations or class two mutations in terms of the effects of drugs like Lumicaftor on uh, traffic of those proteins. So I'd have to defer that to uh, some folks up at Vertex. They could probably answer that for you. But there, but there is data on that, I, to your knowledge. I would have to talk with them before I could. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned staff and the possibility of new studies showing that the, it's, it's quite destructive. Um, in the curve, you notice in early age, uh, before maybe, what, 12 years of age, staph is, very, is present in the lung while Pseudomonas is suppressed. Now, there doesn't seem to be many eradication protocols out there for staph, but they're working on MRSA if we can come up with an eradication to push out staph, then maybe pseudomonas will be pushed out, especially with the new drugs of uh, the, the uh, CFTR modulators coming into uh, play. What can we do about staph in, our, in the younger population? So the, the, in the guidelines, the recommendation is to not use prophylaxis against staph, which is a strategy that's still used in the UK. And the reason for that is there was a very large study done here, it took seven years to finish using staph prophylaxis, which not only showed there was no benefit to the population, but there was already concern that it was leading to a greater chance of developing pseudomonas. And so what you realize is that in you're dealing with infection in the airways, it's a very complex interaction. These bugs are competing with each other, and if you do anything that might give one the upper hand, it might make a difference. So think of it like squeezing the balloon. If you squeeze somewhere, it's just going to pooch out somewhere else. Now, in terms of staff, MRSA gets a lot of press, but I don't think of it different like that. MRSA is methicillin-resistant staph aureus. That is the interaction between a drug and a bug. What you care about in disease is the relationship between that bug and the person. And now we're talking about something called virulence. 
And methicillin susceptibility has nothing to do with virulence. That is not to say there aren't versions of MRSA which are quite virulent and can do harm, but there are also versions of methicillin susceptible staph that are quite harmful. So classifying MRSA just is a way of putting a box around something and looking at it. But I would look at staph much more globally. Um, it's too easy to test for susceptibility and not enough to sort of understand, is this a bug that would be bad? So one of the things we worry about is um, we think we're targeting bugs. So I say, you have pseudomonas, so I'm going to give you this inhaled antibiotic. I'm going to target that pseudomonas. But what I don't know is whether I'm actually targeting that bug or whether that's the bug I want to target because the infection down in here is far more complex. And when I uh, show people you know, the, what we know now about this microbiome, all these different bugs, and you will say, well, what do you, which one's the bug of interest? It's like, where's Waldo? Which one of those is the bug I really want to kill? Because that's the one you'd really want to target. But our approach with inhaled antibiotics, oral antibiotics, is we're, killing, we're affecting lots of different bugs and giving certain advantages to others that are coming back. Yeah, my interest is not prophylactic treatment of staph, mm -hmm. but you've actually cu cultured staph, and it's producing a problem. You're seeing other, right. other issues as, as a result. Now, how do we suppress that or even better eradicate that? So there are clearly people out there who are using suppressive strategies. They do it because the patient is symptomatic. That's the bug they have. So they're putting them on an oral Bactrim or amoxicillin, depending upon the susceptibility. Uh, some of the other drugs that we have available, like linazolid, are just too toxic and too expensive for long-term suppressive therapy. So I showed you there is at least one product that we're using or testing as a function of chronic suppression. And then I know that there's a protocol being developed uh, between Hopkins and Cleveland developing an eradication strategy. And so that I hope we'll hear about uh, soon, uh, starting to enroll patients. Any insight to that eradication protocol with inhaled antibiotics for staff? For eradication? Yes. Uh, at the moment, no. I mean, right now what you have is, is using uh, IV formulations of vancomycin. And so much like we developed with CF, we've taken drugs like inhaled uh, tobramycin, inhaled acetrinam is completing its study for eradication. We've begun to implement it there. I would anticipate the same for staff. All right, well, thank you all very much. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Really appreciate it. So before we introduce the next speaker, I want to remind everyone who wants to attend the Elizabeth Nash Memorial Fellowship and the New Horizons Research Track that you want to leave now. That's going to happen in the Blue Room, which is across from the Robert Quinn, PhD from San Diego State University, and Elise Blanchard, PhD from the University of California at San Francisco, will be presenting. So these are fairly technical presentations, but fascinating. Yes, if you enjoyed the last presentation, uh, you may well enjoy the presentation of the research being funded with your contributions to CFRI. We're going to take a moment or two to uh, swap computers here. Let me invite you to stand and stretch for a moment, if you'd like. And we'll be introducing the next speaker in about two minutes. <laughs>